John chapter 20. We will look at just a little bit over the first half of the chapter, verses 1 through 18. If you remember last week, we uh, in John's gospel, we left Jesus in the tomb. The disciples were in disarray. Nobody knew what was happening. People left the scene of the crucifixion, beating their breasts. The centurion has said, surely this was the son of God. And it was a moment of darkness, of despair. And Jesus was put in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. And so the, she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb. We do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and the other disciple and they were going to the tomb and the two men were running together and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Simon Peter therefore also came following him and entered the tomb and he beheld the linen wrappings lying there. And the face cloth which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple, who had first come to the tomb, entered then also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. So the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. And so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb. And she beheld two angels in white setting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord. And I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and behold, Jesus standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he has said these things to her. What a glorious moment after last week. I think a little later we might watch a short video clip that just is a fun way to look at the resurrection. But first let's look at the scriptures. And when we think of the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, remember we are walking on holy ground. We would probably do well to go shoeless as we read these uh, scriptures. Jesus in Luke 24 and verse 26, uh, when he spoke to the disciples on the Emmaus road, uh, you foolish, foolish man, slow of heart to believe. Did you not know that the Christ must suffer first and then be raised into his glory? And we just saw at the end of the crucifixion, even in the humiliation, glory beginning to be afforded unto Jesus. We see a centurion saying, surely this is the son of God. Those observing who were mockers at first, at least, beating their breasts, knowing a mistake has been made this day. God from heaven attesting to the fact that this was a, this was a horrible moment in the history of mankind. He causes things to go dark for three hours. We, we begin to see the glory coming towards Jesus. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul talks about a wisdom that this world does not understand. And he says that if the rulers, and the word there is the archon, 
of this present world had understood this wisdom, they would not have crucified the Lord of, Lord of glory. Now, many argue, what are the archon there? Because it's used many times in scripture, over 30 times. Sometimes it's used of Jesus as the prince. It was used of the rich young ruler, the ruler. He was the archon. It's used of earthly kings, but it's also used of spiritual powers that oversee things. So where it says that Satan is called the prince of the power of the air, he's the archon. I think the idea here can touch both human authority and spiritual authorities. If the devil had known what he was loosing when he had Christ crucified, he never would have done it. We look at Pilate and, you know, when Jesus gives him answers, even in tidbits of who he is, who his uh, identity is, that he is indeed a king, but not of this world. Are you the son of God then? As you say. Pilate's wanting to release him. Had he known fully, and he was grasping to know, he says, what is truth? You know, is this true what this Jesus is saying? Am I getting, going to be on the wrong side of history? They say that politicians ultimately never want to be on the wrong side of history. And yet, ultimately, half of them are. At least. But that's where Pilate was at. If they had known what was going to happen. Last week we looked and uh, we, we saw the reasons why Christ died. Why this death happened. He died for sins. He died for sinners. He died to redeem us. He desired, died to sanctify us. He died to bring us to God. He died to set a fire in our heart that would cause us to be a peculiar people zealous for good works. He died that he might raise us from the dead. He died that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. And he died that the Christ, that he himself might enter in to his glory. Wow. He died for incredible reasons. And we were on the forefront of his heart as he went to the cross. We also saw in the last couple of weeks, in the grave, we understand that Jesus went to the place called the grave or Sheol, depending the language that we use. Um, he, he went to that place and he made two pronouncements. To the righteous dead, he announced again that it was finished. And Ephesians says that he led captivity captive. In essence, he opened the doorway between the side of the grave where the righteous were waiting, called Abraham's bosom, called paradise, the place that he promised the one thief that he would be with him today. He opened that tunnel or doorway, or whatever it is, we don't know, that heaven itself might be opened into the presence of God. The veil was torn in two in the temple and Jesus opened the doorway, but he also went to that other side of the grave and he proclaimed his victory to the spirits who were once disobedient in the days of Noah. And we understand that they were trying to pollute the human race so that the lineage through which Messiah could come would be broken and irretrievable and so that salvation could not happen. That's what we understand of the sons of God and the daughters of men back in the days of Noah, polluting the godly race of Seth. Some would say that it was the uh, uh, women of the world that were doing that, uh, uh, as some would say that it was angelic beings coming in uh, to the daughters of men. Whichever it was, there was a pollution and Jesus said to them in the grave, you failed, but I didn't. What you wanted to stop, I have finished. So it is finished, a glorious invitation to heaven, and it is finished, your damnation is sealed. It was not a proclamation for a new opportunity to believe the gospel. It wasn't that kind of proclamation. Also, we saw that it's entirely possible, uh, even as Michael kind of alluded to, the different sacrifices. Most of the sacrifices with blood were done in the open. But the grain offerings, the offering of loaves of bread, they were put in an 
oven and literally incinerated. We know that Jesus fulfilled all the sacrifices and those in the oven you couldn't see. It's possible that Jesus suffered hidden sufferings that are common to the condition of fallen mankind but are unseen because they come after death happens. And so it's very possible that in the days in the grave that he had hidden sufferings. We don't know because they were hidden if he did suffer as such. But when we give thanks to God, we give thanks for all that Jesus suffered, wherever it might be on our behalf, that we could receive all of the blessings of God through him because he received our curse to himself, took it to the grave, abolished it, and God the Father said amen and raised him from the grave. Now, in this process, one thing that we don't look at, we don't consider the incredible faith of Jesus. You know, his faith was amazing. Understand this, Jesus was only the promise of the Father away from eternal hell. Only the promise of the Father. That's all he had was the promise of the Father, nothing else when he went to the cross. He went to the cross in worse condition than any human being who ever died. Now, if I went to the grave without Jesus, I would be in bad condition because I sin a lot. Now, Tefik just sins a little. But if he goes to the grave without Jesus, he's in bad condition. But Jesus has my sin and Tefik's sin. So he has more than mine and more than his. But then, Inji sins less than both of us, just a little bit. But he has Inji's sin too. And Lori's, and he has Michael's. He has it all. And then 2 Corinthians takes it further and says, God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf. This Jesus became sin. That's how he went to the grave. But the Bible says that he had the power of an indestructible life. And he tells his disciples before this, the prince or the archon of this world is coming, he has nothing in me. Jesus' perfections as he goes to the cross and the tomb are so absolute that even as the Father makes him sin, makes him into sin, his holiness, his righteousness, his indestructible life, literally like, you know, Superman give me, it can't hold him. I think, how can you be more sin than sin? How could you be worse than that? And yet, Jesus, indestructible, and now we come to the testimony of that in John chapter 19. The disciples are scattered. They're scared. It says in chapter 20 and verse 19, which we didn't get today, they're basically hiding in a room because they're scared of the Jews. In fact, it's hard for Jesus to meet everybody at the same time because they're going up the hill back to where the Galileans stayed on the uh, Emmaus Road. They're traveling here. At one time, he meets seven of them at a sea, uh, seaside fishing resort. Uh, at another time, he meets two on the road. He meets the women, James and and, uh, uh, Peter and John come. They don't get to see Jesus. Uh, they get to see a couple of angels instead. Uh, and so on and so forth. They're scattered. They're so sad. They're confused. They're in burial mode, not expectation. Understand, as we sit here today, we're already getting excited, thinking, Mike, you don't even need to talk about it. We know this stuff. Just play your video and off we go. You know, that's what we're thinking. No, no, we're not, but we could be. Because we know it, but they didn't. They're in burial mode. The, the men are scared, so the ladies who probably wouldn't get arrested, they're lugging some more spices there. They don't get to do their normal custom because... 
Uh, the authorities don't want people around where Jesus was buried. It happened to be just before the Sabbath. And so you've got all this stuff going on. Uh, the men are scared, but usually you would hire about 20 whalers. And these whalers would be uh, uh, wherever the dead person was. And they would literally wail for a full day until you got your sadness out quickly. Now we mope forever in a day. The Jews did it right, man. They just let it out, you know, wailing and moaning and so on and so forth. And you would hire people to do that. And so remember when Jesus raised a little girl from the dead, he goes to the house and they say, she's dead. You know, don't bother teach her anymore. Uh, no, she's just sleeping. And they, they were wailing and then they start laughing. They start laughing at Jesus for saying it. They were the professionals. They didn't have this privilege. And, but during that time, as long as it took you to get your grief out, you didn't want the humiliation of the body. You didn't want the stench. And so you would take these massive vials of spices and you would cover the body. He's already been covered once with 100 pounds on his linens, had been put on him. Those would have begun to dry and stick like this. Uh, almost like a cocoon is what they would be like on Jesus. And so that's the situation. They've come to mourn, only the ladies, they've come to put on more spices. And now on the, on the body, they would also put a special uh, a white thicker piece on the face and they would literally drench it with spices because the decomposition would begin with eyes and tongue. That's just the way it works. And so they would do that. They didn't want the body of Jesus to be degraded. They didn't want that humiliation for Jesus. They wanted to give him whatever honor they could. So they come in burial mode. We know as we put the scriptures together that Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, that was probably the disciple that we call James the lesser. That just means he was younger. Uh, it's possible, but highly unlikely that it was uh, Mary the mother of Jesus because he has a half brother named James, but much more likely the other, but it doesn't say. Uh, we have Salome and she's the mother of James and John, the sons of thunder. Luke 24 mentions a Joanna but many think that Joanna was simply another name uh, for either Mary or Salome, that there were actually three women there. We can't be dogmatic. We don't need to be. So they get there in burial mode. The stone is rolled away, and there's two angels. Now, these angels just show up all the time. I love living in Turkey in America. When we talk about angels, people think that you're a little bit crazy and we just don't believe in the supernatural. We want to take the Sermon on the Mount and say, do it and we'll all be okay. You know, we just throw away the miraculous. But here in Turkey, in this part of the world, man, we believe in angels and supernatural and God that can actually do something. That is so refreshing. God's alive. And so these angels show up. Angels showed up at his birth. They showed up... Uh, 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 at, the, at the resurrection of Jesus, uh, just special times these angels would come. They showed up when Jesus was sweating drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. They ministered to him. When he's coming out of the season of testing, when he's in the wilderness and he's fasting and he's hungry, as his angels came, they ministered to him. Now these two angels, they've come now if you put the gospel accounts together at roughly the same time, the soldiers probably ran away just about as Mary and the other ladies got there. They're horrified because of the earthquake and the uh, stone rolled away and the angelic presence. It says they run to the authorities and they say the body's gone. It's gone. We don't know what to do. At the same time, really closely now, the women who have come, now they leave and run back to the men. There's, there, there's two angels there. One is kind of the spokesman, and then the other one is there. The ladies have gone, and then it says they go to Simon Peter and to the disciple that Jesus loved. That's John. John five times refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, in John 13, 
This is phenomenal. We've taken months to get from John 13 to here. But understand in the life of Jesus, if we go with a Friday crucifixion, then John 13 starts approximately, let's go with uh, 6 to Friday is 24 and 48 to Saturday, about 60 hours. But if we go with a double Passover, a high Passover, uh, a high uh, Sabbath, and, and pull the day back one more day, then we're looking not at 70 hours, but about 94 hours. 94 hours from the beginning of the Last Supper till now. Maybe even 70 with the last, uh, a last Good Friday interpretation. Not very long. And Jesus says that he loved his own and he loved them to the end. So Jesus loved all his disciples, but John was just blown away by the love of Jesus. We had a, a brother here years ago. He since moved to a, another city, and he was a funny guy in many ways. But he would come into the office, and he would just say to me, it used to tick me off. He'd say, you know, I think Jesus loves me more than he does you. Off with you, you know. <laughs> he loves me. But see, he's blown away by the love of God. John the disciple whom Jesus loved. You know, he, he loved them all, but John could just receive it. He knew he was loved by Jesus. And uh, in any way, so he's just responding that he and Simon Peter hear the message. And, you know, they want Jesus to look good even in death. They can't bear the thought that somebody, did they steal the body? to degrade him because they hated him so much. Uh, what do we do when Jesus doesn't live up to our expectations? Even if it's just stay in the grave and let us put some spices on you, Jesus. Even if it's just that little. Oftentimes we have expectations of Jesus which are so small that they're inconsequential, and when he doesn't do it, we're disappointed. We're mortified. We can't believe, and so we're confused, and that's what they were, and they raced to the tomb. They took off running, the two of them, and I like that. I just think we could make a song out of that, racing to Jesus or something, you know, racing to Jesus. Off they go. We're going to take care of this. Hebrews 4 catches the idea. In fact, seven times in Hebrews, the idea is quickly Run to the throne of grace. Draw near quickly. Draw near now. Draw near boldly. Draw near with confidence. Run to Jesus. And that's just what they're doing. They think they're running to a dead Jesus. They see, they look in the tomb. Actually, the race is really wonderful because John is a lot faster. You know, love will motivate you to do more quicker than any other motivation. I can be motivated to do things by fear. I can be motivated by anger. I can be motivated by pride or greed or any number of things can cause us to perform activities, say things, and behave in ways to get what we want. And those things may look good, but they're motivated by less. But love will drive us quicker, faster, longer. That sounds like Nike or Adidas. Quicker, faster, longer. But it will. It takes us forward. And John gets there. And he, he looks in. And then Peter comes on up and just bullies in. It says they saw the linen, linen wrappings and the face cloth. It was folded up, setting by itself. And it was, it was kind of orderly. It was not just thrown away, cut off and thrown out like somebody quickly grabbed Jesus to get away. In fact, if they were going to steal Jesus, they would have taken everything. They would have taken it all. I mean, if you're, if you're going to kidnap, you do it fast, I think. I don't, don't kidnap people. But some people do such things. And, uh, but anyway, they just would have grabbed him and gone. But they didn't. They didn't because he was raised from the dead. And literally raised in glory, he left everything as was and took the time to fold the face covering and set it to the side. And they, they see that there. It's orderly. And then John comes in after Peter. He's the first to believe after the resurrection. It says that he believes. You know, it's interesting, the two angels. One is at the, the, the head, 
and one is at where the feet were laid. Now think of the altar and laying a carcass on it, the head at one side, the feet at the other, and at the Holy of Holies, the great altar, there were two angels, one at the head, one at the tail. They literally come into the Holy of Holies after the sacrifice has been taken away and all that's left on the altar is the blood of God. And by that blood, we are invited into heaven. Invited into heaven. We've just glimpsed, they saw the Holy of Holies. The holy place. I mean, it, it looked like the place of shame. It looked like the place of degradation. But it was the place of glory. And John believed. He saw it and he believed. He didn't understand. It says in our text here, they did not yet understand what risen from the dead might mean. I mean, we look back and say, come on guys, get with the program. But imagine if we were there, we would have been no different because they had no capacity. I mean, I have no functions in my mind. I've, I've never been compelled at a funeral to tell somebody to get up from the coffin. I mean, the faith that God would have to give me to do something like that would be, I can't even imagine it. I don't have a brain function for that. And they didn't either. And so they didn't understand Jesus rising from the dead, but John believed. And then it says they went to their homes. Did they go to tell everybody? Did they go because they knew fairly quickly the soldiers would return and the last thing they needed would be to found, be found there? Why did they go home? Now, I want to take a bypass meadow here. We've tried to pull the other gospels in. And if you've read the resurrection and appearance accounts, you know that they are difficult to put together. I mean, in one place it speaks of Mary Magdalene. And then the other it says Mary, Mary, and either Joanna or um, uh, Salome. And so they're, they're, they're difficult. They seem to, they don't tie perfectly. But let's just look at them. And when you read them all and make a sequence, it comes across really logically. Uh, the two Marys in Salome, they have the early morning time where they came to the tomb. And then in Luke 24, 34, uh, the two disciples on the Emmaus Road tell the disciples after they've gone back that the Lord has risen, has appeared to Mary and to Simon Peter. So by that time in the day, we have the individual meeting with Peter, which 1 Corinthians 15 tells us about. So Mary, Mary and Salome, Peter, in early afternoon, has a special time with Jesus. On the Emmaus Road, two disciples meet with Jesus. And then that night, Jesus appears to 10 of the remaining 11 disciples, but Thomas was not with them, with them perfectly. In the next couple of days, in an evening meeting, he meets with all the disciples, including Thomas. Shortly after that, he meets with seven disciples at the Sea of Galilee. And that's where he confronts Peter. And he says, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? 1 Corinthians 15, verses 6 and 7, says that there's a small gathering and a great gathering. He appears to 500 people at one time. Amazing. But he also has an appearance with his half-brother. James. And now James came with the family to have Jesus institutionalized. And he meets with James and James becomes the leader of the Jerusalem church. That's the James we read about in chapter 15 of Acts. Isn't that amazing? Meeting with the risen Christ changes everything. And that is the Jesus with whom we have relationship. It changes everything. I mean, one of us could go to Jerusalem and lead the church there. We could. Meeting with Jesus changes everything. And then at the day of the ascension, we have recorded uh, a number of disciples with him when he ascended. Now, when they went from the point of ascension back to the upper room, there were 120. We don't know for sure that they were all at the ascension point, but it could have been upwards of that number. 
Uh, so Jesus met with a lot of folks. But when we read Acts 1-3, it says that he met with them and showed them many signs and taught them many things over the span of 40 days. These eight meetings are recorded. I think that Jesus did that with few, with many, with one, and that we see the results of those encounters as proofs. In fact, it says in Acts 1-3, he gave them many incontrovertible truths that they would know that he was raised from the dead. This is testimony. And see, when you just put them all together and don't really think, well, why did it just mention one instead of two? Or All of a sudden, the progression is very logical. It's winsome. It's proving. Now, Mary, as Peter and John leave in our narrative... She has come back and she's outside the tomb weeping. She sees the two angels. There's only blood left on that holy place. It would smell like the Holy of Holies. No other body, remember, had ever been laid there. The scriptural promise of the glorification of Jesus was that God would not allow his body to see decay. So she would have smelled the incense and seen the angels. Isn't that cool? As she goes into the holy place. And these angels, they say things in different places. Why do you look for the dead amongst the living? He's not here. He is risen. Go tell his brothers. Those kind of testimonies. At that kind of place, she now will give complaint to this person she sees, thinking it's the gardener. She's really giving it to Jesus. So she gave it where she should, but didn't know she was doing so. But you know, God does not get uptight when we give those doubts and complaints and such to him, especially with a good heart. Not like the children of Israel in the desert where they were complaining with a bad heart. She's actually, her complaint is followed by a promise to serve. Uh, Sir, if you've taken him somewhere... Just tell me and I'll, I'll take over his body. I'll take care of it. You know, I'll, I'll do it. It wasn't just a, where did you take him? It was a heart that was grieved, a heart that wanted to honor her Lord's body, uh, a heart that was willing to do the hard work. And yet she let that grief be known. She said, isn't it amazing? We come to a cross on Calvary, it's empty. We come to a tomb, it's empty, and we turn. And maybe not even recognizing it, we're face to face with the living Jesus. And that's where we belong, and that's where Mary is, face to face now with the living Jesus. And now, Jesus questions her. And we need to allow Jesus to question us, to ask us, to speak to us, not always be speaking to him. And, and so he just says in verse 15, why are you weeping? Whom do you seek? And I look at Jesus and I think that's pretty obvious. Uh, just like saying to the two disciples on the Emmaus Road, what are you talking about? And they said, don't, are you the only one that don't know, doesn't know what happened these last few days? He's the only one who did know what happened. But he asked that not for information, but because they need to say it. And there are times we need to say something to Jesus. We just have to let it out. The why, Jesus. Why did you let this happen? Why did it work like this? Why didn't it work the way it should have worked? Well, actually, my son, it did. It worked out perfectly just the way it should have. Whom do you seek? Why are you weeping? What's wrong? Jesus questions. She doesn't recognize. I mean, it's early. Been weeping. No mental category for somebody rising from the dead. And then Jesus says, Mary. And she says, Rabboni, my teacher. That's just so lovely. Remember what Jesus said in chapter 10? My sheep hear my voice and they know it. And she knew her shepherd's voice. She knew her shepherd's voice. And when we hear Jesus calling, we know his voice. There have been times when I've needed to do something in the morning and I didn't wake up. And it's funny, in a fog of a sleep, I'll think I hear Mike. And sometimes I'll think, did Lori call me from the other room? And usually it wasn't. It's never audible. 
But it's just, I think I hear it. And I just wonder if it's Jesus saying, get up, up with you. I, I, I don't know. But usually it always corresponds to when I need to be up doing something. There just seems to be a correspondence there. But has anyone ever had that experience in a semi-sleepy mode and you just think you heard your voice said? You know, and sometimes it is Lori from the other room, but uh, not always. And she comes to him and grabs him. Strange response here. Jesus, after the resurrection, he invites his disciples, touch me, handle me, hold me. See, it's me. I'm not a ghost. Put your fingers in the hands, in the side. It's me. Touch me. Hold me. But here, now they say, don't cling to me. But really the word there in Greek is don't touch me. Don't touch me. Why would he say that now? He said, I've not yet ascended to my father and your father. I would suggest to you, I don't know, but the suggestion being is he hasn't yet met with father. In Hebrews, it speaks of the earthly uh, holy of holies, the altar, all of that stuff, and it had to be cleansed with blood. But it says they're just a copy of the heavenly, and the heavenly must be cleansed with better things, better sacrifices. That's just a check on me. He Hebrews 9, 23 to 25. Just a suggestion. He's left the altar, and He's done his work of proclamation in the grave, suffered whatever may be needed suffered. Is it possible that Mary, the first to see him, has just caught him between as he ascends to the Father to present himself as the priest, the sacrifice, and the blood, and cleanse with better offerings the better things? Maybe. I just, if so, then... Uh, she caught him right then and so no time to hold on and he says you go tell the disciples I'm ascending wait wait Jesus ascension day that's 40 days from now I'm ascending to my father and your father to my God and your God and the suggestion being from that time on that Jesus I mean he walks through walls he does everything he's just going back and forth from the arena that we call heaven to the arena we call earth Constant communion, uninterrupted with the Father. I, and I just put that, remember last week, that's not a test of fellowship. That's just a theological thought to put in hot chocolate and drink at night. As if it, and, and just see if it ministers to you that Jesus presented himself to the Father and said, the Father that I go to is your Father. Your Father. My Father your Father, my God, your God. Even if there is no distance now between the Father and I, there's none between you and the Father because I have done what I have done. If so, that's great news. Great news. All that's left at this point, it's announcement time. It's time for announcements. And Jesus has risen from the grave. Angels say, he is risen. Mary says, I've seen the Lord. He's risen. The two disciples from Emmaus. The Lord has risen indeed. He appeared to us, to Mary, and also to Simon Peter this afternoon. The disciples, they announce it to Thomas. And then in Mark 16, 20, it says they went and they announced it everywhere. I suggest to you, the evidence is overwhelming. They would have never done such a thing for a lie. Everyone has lied. All men are liars, the Bible says. You know, everyone has told a lie. Hopefully, as we've come to Jesus, we've stopped and that we're truth tellers. But usually if we get caught, if we understand there's going to be a bigger punishment, we come clean then. And we say, oh, yeah, I, uh, I, I told a lie or whatever. None of them recant this story. None of them ever turn back. They die for it. It's announcement time that Jesus is risen from the grave. That's good news. I want to leave us with that. We've got three minutes, and we've got a four and a half minute film clip. 
And this clip, I like to use childish songs, simple little songs. You know, I, I sing, Jesus loves me, this I know when I'm depressed. And this one with some, it's got some theological weaknesses, but one of my favorite old singers, and it's a song about resurrection because from crucifixion time to this moment, everything changes. And remember, the powers that crucified the Lord of glory would not have done, done so if they knew the end result. This talks about their rising horror as they realize that the resurrection indeed could happen. So if you enjoy it, enjoy it. If not, then just know it's one of Brother Mike's idiosyncrasies to like little songs like this. And it hits the resurrection. The demons were planning on having a party one night. They got beer, Jack Daniels, and pretzels, little red wine, and some wine. They were celebrating how they crucified Christ on that tree. But Satan, the snake himself, wasn't so at ease. Well, he took his crooked finger and he dialed the phone by his bed. Call an old faithful friend Who'd know for sure If he was dead Hey grave Satan said Tell me Did my plan fail Old grave just laughed and said The dude is dead as nails Ooh, On Friday night They crucified the Lord at Calvary And a horror flick Didn't calm Satan's fear So Saturday night He called up Grave Scared of what he'd hear Hey Grave What's going on? Grave says Man, you've called me twice And I'll tell you One more again, boss The Jews on ice devil said, man, remember when Lazarus was in his grave? He said, everything was cool, then four days later, boom, he was raised. And now this Jesus is much more trouble than anyone has been to me. And it's got me shook, cause he says he'll only be dead three. morning Satan woke with a jump ready to blow a fuse he was shaking from the tips of his pointed ears to the toes of his pointy shoes he said grave tell me is he alive I don't want to lose my neck the grave said your evilness maintain your cool you are wrecked Grave 
said, oh, now cool your jets, big D. My sting is still intact. You see, Jesus is dead forever. Man, he ain't never coming back. So just uh, mellow out, man. Don't drink up or shoot up, but just leave me alone. And I'll catch you later. Oh, no, man. Oh, no. And an angel stepped inside said, hey, I'm Gabriel, who are you? If you're wondering where the Lord is at this very hour, I'll tell you, he's alive and well with the resurrection. Sunday's on the way yeah. Amen Anyway, that's just I, I like that one It stirs my soul And uh, just reminder today That when we go out into life You know, sometimes we experience The enemy's attack difficulties of life and all that stuff and the limit the limit of God's potential ability to deliver us is the resurrection of Christ he's raised from the dead amen and amen